Hello, everybody, and welcome to Honey Badger Radio. My name is Brian Martinez, and I am your host here on today's Fireside Chat. I am joined by Dr. Elizabeth Bates. Dr. Elizabeth Bates is a lecturer in psychology and domestic violence. Uh, she's also a domestic violence researcher specializing in male victims of female domestic abusers. She's challenged the male control paradigm informing current interventions in domestic, into domestic violence and is a trustee of Mankind UK, a helpline for male victims of domestic violence. Hello, Dr. Bates. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good, good. And did I get all that right or... <laughs> Yeah, no, that was that was a very good introduction. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Dr. Bates, I found you on Twitter recommended to me by one of our listeners. And so I, I looked into what you did and I thought I have to get her on the show. So I'm really happy that you responded so quickly and you took an interest in coming on. Uh, guys, if you are watching, please consider that if there are problems with the stream, you can watch us also on Twitch or on the Facebook page. Uh, we do have the streams occurring in multiple places, so just go to wherever it's best. Also, be sure to hit that like button because it does a lot for our analytics and lets people know that we are streaming, which invites more people to watch the stream if we get enough. And lastly, if you're not already subscribed to our channel um, and feel free to share these these conversations because I think they are vitally important. Okay, so uh, Dr. Bates, how did you come to study this male side of domestic violence victims, specifically men as victims of female aggressors? Uh, well, when I started um, doing my degree um, quite a few years ago now, um, I'd had a lecture about women's violence and specifically women's violence in um, domestic relationships. And I'd just never at that point considered, um, as I think a lot of people haven't, that women could be violent in relationships and violent towards men in that way. And so it sort of sparked an interest really that started my research journey through sort of my dissertation and then on into my PhD where I was really exploring the predictors and the different things that feed into domestic violence and people's partner violence. I looked specifically within my PhD research at men's and women's partner violence. I looked at the personality predictors of it. Um, I also looked at the overlaps that occur with control and behaviour and with aggression to same-sex others in a not in an intimate relationship. And sort of found that there were men and women were reporting very similar levels of perpetration of domestic violence in relationships. Mm -hmm. So they were reporting mm -hmm. perpetrating violence at fairly similar rates. So I really wanted to kind of unpick, once I got my PhD, I sort of wanted to unpick further that idea actually that there were male victims that were not reporting it and not getting help and support because it was an issue that we just still don't talk about as much as we do other types of domestic violence so it led me down a path of exploring men's experiences and really i suppose finding that actually they are really quite significant despite some of the criticisms of certain types of research being that men don't really feel the impact of it and that it's not as serious an issue for men as it is for women and um, in contrast i found that it's it's just the same there are very similar levels of um, abuse and psychological abuse emotional abuse physical abuse that's experienced yeah. um but it's men experience other barriers i think in coming forward and other specific sort of types of impact of it that's kind of wrapped up in this idea of masculinity and what makes men men in this um, day and age so it kind of led me down this path of exploring this in more detail oh uh, what um what do you, what what in your experience uh have you found in terms of the reasons why men don't um you know report being victims of domestic violence according to your research well, I've tapped into that a little bit with a study that I did last year, and I'm actually currently collecting data at the moment. I'm looking for men who feel comfortable completing an online questionnaire at the moment to tell me a little bit more about that. But what I found within the first study that I did in, in and amongst the, the stories men were telling me about how severe the abuse was and how bad the control and the manipulation was, a lot of them talked about different reasons that they'd never told anybody. So, for example, some people told me that it was the first time they'd ever told anybody when they were writing it down to me. Um, I think that part of that was because my questionnaire is anonymous. I have no idea and no way of knowing who's completed it. It's really, um, It was really important to me to do that to try and overcome some of these barriers. 
I think that there are lots of personal barriers that men experience in terms of feeling ashamed, feeling embarrassed, feeling like they don't want to tell anybody about it, not possibly identifying themselves as what you might call a victim of domestic violence. Um, and a lot of those issues are very similar for men and for women. Um, in terms of further barriers that I think are fairly specific to men, um, whilst we talk a lot about, and, and I can completely understand men and women both not wanting to come forward because they feel ashamed of it, um, you know, and they shouldn't do, obviously, but a lot of men, I think, worry that they won't be believed um, yeah. and that there is a lot of it, a lot of how we see what domestic violence kind of looks like in a stereotypical sense. I think that a lot of men worry that they won't be believed some of the men had tried to get help and had been either laughed at or told that they were a man, so they must be the perpetrator, or they were told that they must have done something to deserve it. So I think there's lots of layers of barriers that exist for men in terms of being able to actually get help and support for this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that, that's, uh, I just wanted uh, to also let everybody know that um, Allison has joined the call. Uh, Liz, this is Allison Tiemann. She is the... Um, I guess you could say the founder of Honey Badger Radio, or at least the boss. So she may also have some things she wants to add. Uh, Allison, this is Liz. Hi, Bates. I just wanted Hi. to thank you for for taking uh, taking on an, an issue that a lot of people there's a lot of stigma around, and uh, being a champion for male victims of domestic violence by women. And uh, I, I have actually looked at your research and read some of it, and I really appreciate. Um, the fact that you are challenging this kind of mainstream, I, I guess you could call it mainstream attitude towards domestic violence, then it's basically male against female. And it's a, it's a form of patriarchal control rather than being a cycle of abuse. So I just wanted to, to express my appreciation for that. And um, I came in a little bit late, so I don't know what questions you've already answered, but I did want to ask, how did you come to study male side of domestic violence victims uh, specifically men as victims of female aggressors uh, well i did explain a little bit about that before but i'll say it. i'm happy to say it again i'd um i'd explored some in my re in my earlier sort of work during my degree somebody did introduce me to this idea that actually women could be violent towards men and having been like having realized it was not something that i'd ever considered at that point before then because when we talk about domestic violence in society we always talk about it or we always kind of pres presume that it is a man um, being abusive to a woman and then as I sort of explored that in more detail, I, I became, I don't know, I suppose I wanted to fight for the, the victims that weren't being heard and that weren't getting the same help and support because we just don't talk about it the same. So it's kind of, it's it's come from that really. I've been doing it about uh, 10 or 11 years now. All right. The other question I had was... Um, do you, what are your what are your criticisms of uh, the predominant model? I know that you wrote a, uh, a paper called "Testing Predictions from the Male Control Theory of Men's Domestic Violence," and it essentially found that this particular the control theory, which I guess we could term th the feminist theory of domestic violence, it found that it had no predictive validity in terms of of explaining the data that you found. Could you tell us a bit more about your criticisms of that of the predominant model? Absolutely. Um, the Duluth or the feminist model or the gendered model of domestic violence, um, it goes under a sort of a lot of names, but it's really the very dominant narrative that still exists at the moment in terms of how we talk about domestic violence. Um, I have issues with it on several levels, really. I think that this idea that actually men are abusive to women um, as a function of a patriarchal society and they're, they're establishing their male privilege and uh, have it been all kind of wrapped up in this feminist idea. I do think that that's probably an appropriate model for quite a small group of the men that are abusive towards women. Um, but my main criticisms of it are the things that it ignores so that I think domestic violence when men perpetrate it and when women perpetrate it is so much more complex than that model allows. I think that the research that we found um, that has you know, looked at 
the different things that feed into it. So, for example, um, the personality and the psychopathology that feeds into it, um, adverse childhood experiences that feed into it. There's loads of different things that can make men and women be abusive in relationships. Um, and I think that that Duluth kind of feminist model is probably only the case for quite a small group of men who do it. I think that it also ignores a lot of the other research that we know at the moment now about domestic violence. So for example, the prevalence of female perpetration and male victims, the Duluth or the feminist model will only see women's violence as being in self-defense or as part of a sort of battered women's syndrome, whereas actually women are being abusive in, in a situation and, and for reasons that are so much more complex than that. It ignores bi-directional abuse so that actually roughly half of the relationships where domestic violence exists it's mutual so men and women are being abusive to each other in that relationship including obviously in the lgbtq plus um, communities as well so there's relationships are violent it isn't just men that are violent and i think that there's just all these different issues that are wrapped up within a model that it just can't explain um, and so that yeah the paper that you're referring to was where i i took some data and i tested actually the different predictions from it and I didn't find any support for it at all. And as I say, I do think it's probably the case for quite a small group of men who do use um, their own patriarchal attitudes, their own male privilege, their tr very traditional gender role attitudes, perhaps. But I think that for a lot of men's and, and women's violence outside of that, it's, it's a lot more complex than that model allows. Would you say that, I mean, saying that there are some abusive men who use, uh, I guess, uh, you would, might term uh, attitudes or uh, cultural beliefs about male control and power, as you called patriarchal, would would that equally be true for, uh, at, Brian, we're, I'm getting a really bad echo from you. Uh, I'll mute myself here, hold on. I don't know why okay. that's happening, but go ahead. <laughs> Speaking of, <laughs> all right, would that be equally true of the unilateral female abusers? using beliefs about women being response or being in charge in the home and other stuff like that to justify their abuse? Um, my research hasn't looked at that. I'm not aware of any research that's explored that specifically. Um, there are lots of other things um, that are known to predict women's violence, such as, for example, controlling behaviour and that kind of need to be um, in control and to manipulate and to maintain that sort of dominance in the relationship. Things like that have definitely been shown to be predictive, but I'm not 100% sure around things like those, those sort of attitudes around a woman being in charge, that almost matriarchal, I suppose you might say, uh, but I'm not, I couldn't answer that, I'm afraid. I don't know the answer to that. So there's no, there's no research into that kind of, because uh, you, you, if you, sometimes you can go and you can find things like if, uh, if mom isn't happy, no, ain't nobody happy, kind of, that kind of, uh, the attitude that uh, the, the mother is sort of the central figure and the, the dominant figure in the home, morally and emotionally. And, uh, and I'm just wondering, it, since there isn't any research into that, it would be interesting to find, do that kind of research and then compare it to the reverse where um, male uh, control, controlling men use narratives or find narratives in culture where, you know, the man is, leads the house. Although, I mean, even in the Christian culture, um, even in the fundamentalist Christian churches, men are supposed to may be the head of the house, but they are supposed to sacrifice to make sure that their wives are protected and provided for and not harmed. So, I mean, it's almost like this one sided, they pick out one little piece of, of what they're being told and they focus on that to justify their behavior. It's almost like if, uh, if a man is in, is, is in that kind of uh, uh, what she would term patriarchal control mindset, it's more like he's justifying something that isn't actually justified by what he's being told by these these systems of belief, but he's just cherry picking to justify abusive behavior. That could be true, and it could be the case that even when a man or a woman f looks like it f fits into this idea that we've just described, it could be that it's just, the thing is your beliefs about aggression or your beliefs about gender roles, it's only one part of what drives your behavior. There are a lot of other aspects, and I don't think that there's just a one a one answer I think to, to what predicts violence because it's it, I, I know I keep saying it but it is just so much more complex than that and the family system that it exists in and the relationship that it exists in 
that could be one part that could be predictive of it, but it would be part of something a bit um, more complex than that as well, I would say. Okay, well, essentially what I was getting at is maybe that these the the abuse becomes comes before the excuse in other words they engage in abusive behavior and then they make oh, excuses about it using these yeah. these kind of theories and or, or these kind of things that they've been told is what i'm that could be true as well i mean a lot of um again it's not something i've looked at personally but it could be the case because sometimes we act in the heat of the moment or we, it's a loss of self-control and then there is a retrospective attempt to try and explain it through through whatever actions or reasons that we find but it could that could be true but as i say it's not something that i've, I've looked at personally okay all right well i'll move on to another question then um so have you experienced any kind of resistance or backlash to your work uh yes yes i have yeah um it's quite controversial um still in different uh, different areas I suppose some people are very open to it and a lot of people that have never kind of come across it before will you know will listen and be open and think well I just never considered it I suppose a bit like I was you know when I first started um when I first started sort of researching it but yeah there's some resistance to it in one of the papers that I did um I tried to explore sort of what domestic violence perpetrator programs looked like within the UK um, and it was part of a, a wider world review that was being done so I was just kind of covering the UK aspect of it and in attempting to get organisations to tell me about the programs and things and the curriculums of the programs that they offered um, they basically <laughs> they didn't want to take part in it because it was my research and I was known to work with men and, and that sort of thing. So there is quite a lot of resistance still to this idea um, of working with male victims and supporting male victims, as well as, I suppose, challenging this, this dominant narrative that there is around gender. All right. Has that, uh, have you experienced any sort of personal impact from this, res uh, this um, resistance at all? Uh, I wouldn't say personally, no, not too, not too much. I mean, there's, there's a lack of support in some areas for it. Um, I've been asked tough questions when I've presented and done talks on it. Um, but they're always what I do and what I, you know, it's not what I believe in. It, you know, it's what the evidence shows. It's what my evidence shows. And it's something I feel very passionate about. So I'm never really intimidated by being asked quest challenging questions about it because I know that what I'm doing is grounded in good scientific research. And so I can defend all of the work that I've done and, and, and indeed the work within the wider sort of area of other researchers that look at this sort of aspect you know there are lots of people that are doing research that is in con contradiction to this gendered model um, and I suppose it's just not talked about as much still in society so I think it's something that we need to talk about more all right thank you I that's pretty much all the questions I had so I'm gonna okay all right, hand well, it off to Brian thanks Allison thank you. Um, yeah thanks for uh, asking those those are those are really great questions I also propose to the chat to the people watching if they have any questions themselves then they can just bring them up and we'll uh, we'll take the um, the ones that are the most relevant um, and you know we'll pass them on so Allison's experiencing some lag so Allison, you can go ahead and take off I can take it from here uh, thanks for thanks for I can't hear you very well at the moment. Is that so? You can't hear me? Um, You're very sort of muffled. Yeah, you are absolutely like, uh, if you can mute yourself again, Brian, you might need to leave and come back um, um, for just a second. Because you're, for some reason, your internet is has totally crapped out. No, uh, I, well, the guys that are watching, does it, do I sound okay? It might. It um, might. The thing is that if, 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 uh, if Dr. Bates can't hear you, then she won't be able to answer your questions. I understand. I understand. Um, I just wanted to make sure. Okay, so it looks like it's an issue with Google yeah. Hangouts uh, because they the people watching can hear me fine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the call and I'm going to come okay. back. It might it All might right, drop great. everything. Just stay there for a Sorry second. Sorry about okay? this. It's uh, we we seem to be plagued with technical difficulties. I'm not even sure yeah. where this one is coming from. It's probably Comcast, actually. Uh, I'll be right That's, back. That's uh, Brian's. Give me a second, dudes. I'm um, still streaming, so I'm gonna just go ahead and go to the place. 
Um, what is this? What is this? Oh, I can just uh, grab the link and just go in there. There we go. If, if you would can, might consider coming back and talking to her as well I'm back. at some point. Okay, Brian's back. I'm Don't back. have to answer. We're we're back on air. <laughs> um, uh, so I want to thank before I leave. And Brian, sound you sound great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave and let Brian take it from here. And I really appreciate you coming on, uh, Professor or Dr. Bates, and all of your work that you've done in helping men who are victims of domestic violence by women. So thank, thank you. you, and I'll leave you in Brian's capable hands. All right. Thank you. I am back. Uh, it, it isn't an HB stream without technical difficulty. I don't know. I think it was when I muted myself, there was a problem. I think it's Google, not, uh, not Comcast because my internet was fine. But that being said, all right. So I did get a question from one of our viewers. Um, they said, and I wanted to ask you about this too, because I know that you're probably, you probably researched this as well. Um, why do single mothers resort to violence or escalation in the form of yelling whenever a boy child messes up? Or more specifically, can you talk a bit about, um, I don't know if you've looked at it, but when you say, you know, male victims of domestic violence, do you also look at violence against male children or maybe just children in general? No, I just focus on the violence and the violence or abuse that exists between um, intimate partners. So I don't work with children. Um, I know that there is overlap between sort of domestic violence and other types of abuse that can occur in the home. One thing that I have looked at within the data that I got was um, the way that children can be used as a tool for manipulation, though. Um, like women use as 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 you know research suggests that men can do this but I think that women do this more and it's something where there is um I mean you asked somebody asked me about the barriers before that exist to men reporting and one of the things is the threats that occur before you know when the abuse is taking place especially if there are children in the house mm -hmm. so for example women often threaten that they will take the children away or that they will not let them see the child again or that they will make false allegations of domestic violence or abuse to the children would then again prevent the man from seeing his children and I think that that's one of the things that can keep men within an abusive relationship especially because the system that exists outside of that is still quite geared towards helping women more than men yeah. um, so I think that there are a lot of men that fear they wouldn't actually get the help and support um, you know, if they ask for help, which um, unfortunately has been proven right in several cases, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how often does, do you also look at emotional abuse as well as the physical abuse? And if so, yeah. how often does the emotional abuse be, like transcend into physical abuse? Do you... um, I, I mean, I couldn't put a number on it exactly, but sure. I think that um, quite a lot of the time um, within the, the I had 161 men who completed the survey that I did last year and the controlling behavior was there for nearly all of them. So the sort of emotional, psychological control and things, that's all kind of is an overlap with the words that we use, but it all pretty much means the same sort of behavior. Mm -hmm. And there was a huge amount of that within the study. But I would say that a lot of that did escalate into physical abuse, although not actually all of the time. Um, the control and the emotional side of it is something that kind of starts, I think, where the manipulation and trying to kind of just seek and establish control over that person is something that starts earlier in the relationship just through little things and then it can escalate into quite severe emotional abuse mm -hmm. um, including the sort of threats then that I mentioned but also it can it can you know escalate into physical verbal physical and sometimes sexual abuse as well yeah uh do you also um, did you also look at instances where women and I think that this is also fairly common they may not uh, do violence themselves but they may use for example, um, they may use the institutions like the police to do stuff for them. So, uh, what what kind of um, I guess what what do you what have you found with that? Um, that yeah, unfortunately, that is the case for um, again quite a few of the men within my sample. They reported that um, either through the sort of the threats of it which I think was a really major part of the control that they used. Um, but yeah, for a lot of the men had experienced their partner calling the police and reporting domestic violence, even though it had been them that was the victim. 
um, and reporting and making false allegations towards, um, so like false allegations of them of abuse by the man to the child, which then meant that the um, children weren't allowed to see the father. So there were some men in the sample that I'd got who hadn't seen the children for years because of this ongoing battle of um, abuse, of sort of post-separation abuse, I call it. So it's abuse, even though relationships broken down, mm -hmm. there's a continuous manipulation of the system. Within the literature, um, other, other researchers call it legal and administrative aggression. So it's a type of aggression whereby a woman, I mean, it is, it is applicable to women and men, but I think it's something that women do more, where they manipulate and use a system that they know is going to support them to then further manipulate and victimize men in that sense. So yeah, I did see that quite a lot. Yeah, I see. And uh, are there uh, any psychological effect, like negative uh, psychological effects of, you know, affecting men that have been uh, experienced this stuff, especially if they don't think they've uh, be, they can get any support or if they try to get support the Duluth model is what is used on them which often tells them that the reason why this is happening is because of them do you know do you see what I'm saying are there any yeah. um uh, side like you know uh, psychological effects for that and what might those be if there are yeah, so there were some men within the sample that had tried to call and ask for help and had been accused of being a perpetrator and, and like a perpetrator in disguise or something. Um, and that had a massive impact on the men who then just basically said that they would never tell anybody else ever again because they've kind of put themselves out there to ask for the help and support. And then when it's denied or they're accused in that way, they just then think, well, I'm not going to tell anybody ever again. So that was quite a massive part of that. I mean, in general, the men within the sample talking about this abuse that they'd experienced, it was having really significant effects on them. There was report, they'd sort of use words like anxiety and depression within their PTSD. Um, some men um, aren't in a relationship anymore and, and won't be in a relationship again for a long time because of the fear and the lack of trust that they kind of, they worry about. Um, more than one man said they'd had thoughts about taking their own life. One man had tried to take his own life mm -hmm. and and not succeeded and it, i remember reading that one in particular where he, he basically said that he tried to do it and he woke up and he was lying next to her and it was the worst moment of his life because he was still living in this hell that he couldn't get out of yeah um are there uh do you see in your research any uh, higher or uh instances of a suicide or self-harm as a result of this um, it's not something that I've looked at specifically at this point in my research because I'm still kind of um, trying to explore the experiences and look at the barriers to help seeking. Mm -hmm. I know sort of anecdotally that it is it is the case that some men are experiencing really severe mental health problems that have come from being in an abusive relationship, which overlaps a lot with the sort of stuff that we see in the literature on women's experiences. So we talk a lot about the sort of the hideous mental health outcomes and physical health outcomes often too. And they're very similar for men and for women. Mm -hmm. And I think that that feeds into then, obviously within, I mean, within the UK, um, there are 84 men a week commit suicide. And I can't, you know, the mental health crisis that we have with men and men's mental health in particular and the statistics like that, they kind of paint a picture that there are a lot of men that aren't getting the help and support that they need. And that it very well could be related to something like domestic violence and abusive experiences. It could be a whole range of factors, of course, but, you know, it's something to, to consider looking into more. Yeah. Uh, are, are there also, um, have, has any of your work, that uh, giving you any insight as to uh, any other patterns when it comes to domestic violence, such as if it's if it's more likely to happen in uh, you know people who live in poverty or in lower income areas, or it doesn't really matter. It's just uh, transcends no. all of that stuff. It's across all all genders, all social classes, all ethnicities, all all social groups. Mm -hmm. Um, it's such a pervasive social issue that it isn't the case that any groups experience it more than others. I think that it's, as I said um, to Alison before, it's such a complex issue, um, that it, there's so many different things that feed into it. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, one other thing, have you had in your work? I know that you've gotten resistance and you've gotten people who've critiqued you or they don't believe what you do and all that. Have you also had people come to you and, and you know, express gratitude or, 
uh, reach out to you to tell you about their to their experiences and how grateful they are that you're looking into this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. And it's so um, I don't know what the word like. It, I don't want to say encouraging, but it, it gives me it keeps me going sometimes because it isn't always easy to do it when there is so much resistance. But every time. You know, if, sometimes, you know, my the university reports on the work that I've done or there might be a news article on it. And every time somebody will get in touch and say how grateful they are to know that somebody out there is doing research on this. And it's just that it's just not talked about enough because there are quite a few people doing research trying to raise awareness of this. But kind of an, at a societal level, we just don't talk about men's victimization enough, in my opinion. Mm hmm. Absolutely. So um, what, how many, uh, what other studies have you done uh, besides the one that you uh, are talking about that we've been referencing recently? Um, that was the big one that I did last year. Um, my PhD data that I mentioned before was where I was, that was my testing predictions from the male control theory. So that was very much about looking at predictors of men's and women's partner violence. I've done a couple of studies like that, just exploring different predictors of it. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I suppose in summary, there are lots of different things that contribute towards this. Um, my review of domestic violence perpetrator programs that was published last year as well, that was something that... Um, that's where I, I really sort of experienced a lot of the resistance to it, but it was really important in highlighting how um, dominant the narrative is still around this gendered model and actually the evidence and stuff that I pulled together for that that just demonstrates it's not really very effective and yet it's still obviously very popular. Um, and I know that in the US it's mandated in different counties and states and things like that. So it's, it's still a really incredibly powerful model, but it's not one that's got the evidence behind it to support it being so powerful. So that was um, another one that I did okay. as well. All right. And uh, do you have any future studies that you plan on doing or, you know, any, any other things? Do you have something in mind? Yeah, the one that as I mentioned earlier that I'm working on at the moment is trying to explore in more detail the barriers that men experience to reporting, asking for help, telling people about it. Um, as I said, what I'd found last year was that there seemed to be some quite complex barriers that exist on different levels. So I'm trying to explore a little bit more about that at the moment. And I've, I've kind of advertised that through my Twitter account as well. Um, and I also want to focus a little bit on kind of this after part because the the findings that I got around post the, the abuse continuing post separation through the children and, and manipulation in that sense I kind of want to explore that in more detail as well because again I think that a lot of how we talk about domestic violence is often about trying to support the victim and the perpetrator when they've separated but actually it, again it's not always it's not always the case that they separate quite so cleanly in that sense there's often such a lot of ongoing issues that can then really impact on both parents and the children so i think that that needs a bit more exploration as well oh yeah absolutely that is that's great um have you been able to get on to say any news shows or talk shows or any you know any large podcasts have you been able to get a platform to talk about these things or uh no but i don't necessarily think that that's as a resistance to my research i think it's just no. perhaps not very well known in that sense for anybody to think so i'm always happy to talk about it because i think it's such an important issue to talk about and there's a lot of times where I've done talks and things and people have said to me after, you know, I just never really considered that men could be victims. So I think if there's ever, if there's even one person listening that might think, oh, I hadn't thought about that, then it, it kind of is worthwhile doing these sorts of things to try and raise awareness. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I guess I get one question from Caitlin Bianchi. She gave us a $2 donation. Thank you, Caitlin. She says, is there hope for change in the near future? Yes, I do think that there is. It's quite slow, um, but there is progress being made because I've been doing this now for just over 10 years and I see a difference um, within the UK anyway, in particular about how we talk about it and a little bit more attention within the media and things is being given to male victims. So I do think that there is some progress being made, um, but obviously it would be better if it was happening more um, just to really try and make sure that these men that are very vulnerable and, and having these sort of horrible experiences could get the same sort of help and support that's available for women as well. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> ha has any of your uh, research shown, like, have you been seeing the trends? Like, are we seeing more instances of domestic violence in general? Uh, or is it sort of on the decline? Or uh, have you, do you know anything about that? I'm not really completely sure on a sort of societal level about the trends of it. I know that we seem to see more female perpetrated domestic violence towards men within the UK and I'm not sure whether it's the case that women are becoming more violent or whether it's just that actually the little bit of awareness raising that we've managed to do means that men are feeling more comfortable coming forward to report it. It's quite hard to kind of understand yeah. which one's which really but I, I do think we, the more we talk about it the more likely we are to try and sort of tackle it as an issue yes i i was thinking the same it's it, it it's hard to say whether it's because women are doing it more or because men are coming forward more i'm inclined to lean towards the latter but uh that is with you know uh, take that with a grain of salt because i just assume that human beings haven't changed that much and it's more likely that men are just talking about it more um i actually you know, uh, again, if you, okay, look, I've got no more questions and I think this was really great, but I wanted to ask you, do you know who um, Aaron Pitsy is, speaking of domestic violence? Erin Pitsy, yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, she's the woman, for those of you guys who are watching that don't know, she opened the very first women's shelter uh, in, uh, in, in the UK and she found shortly after uh, she did that, that the women that were in the shelter, uh, many of them were as violent as their the spouses that they were hiding from, uh, specifically towards their children. So I thought since, and Aaron Pitsy's um, dealt with a lot of backlash for trying to address that. Uh, if you, if you um, are interested, you know, um, Liz Bates, doctor, if, if I, I want I don't want to be disrespectful <laughs> um, <laughs> <it's fine. laughs> then uh, you should consider again we were talking about this before the call uh, consider going to the um, the International Conference on men's issues because Aaron Pitsy usually goes to these and I know that she's um, you know getting very old now so I'm not really sure if uh, she's got a lot of time to, to be going to these events, but she would love to meet somebody like you because you're doing the work that she's always wanted to see done. And I would uh, like to say on behalf of her and the rest of us here at HBR that we're really grateful that somebody like you is looking into these issues. And there are a lot of men that uh, need this help. And it's, it's, I guess it's just not, it's not even that the, uh, that people who currently talk about domestic violence don't have the best intentions. But I think that we need to open up the conversation and let men in so that we can really address the issues and see them for what they are, which are not uh, some part of a patriarchal structure, but rather mm -hmm. I think it's just damaged people with other damaged people that don't know how to engage in healthy relationships. Does that make sense? Yeah, I would agree with that. And what I know about Erin Pizzi's work, I've read a few of her books, actually. It's just this idea that actually we're not, it isn't the case that it's always a perpetrator and a victim. And I think that some of the language we use when we talk about domestic violence, especially within sort of the um, police services and things, is we have, we like to say this is the perpetrator, this is the victim. But it's just not always as straightforward as that, because sometimes there are quite violent relationships where he might do more than she might do more, or then it might be both together. And as I say, it's across different, you know, combinations of genders in relationships as well. It's just that sometimes there are not healthy conflict resolution strategies, like you say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, I got nothing else to ask. We've gone uh, for about 40 minutes. I think this is great. And uh, Kill Fang, the King of Reason, asks, Brian, how do I get in contact with Dr. Liz? I put contact information in the low bar. I just put her Twitter and her um, researchgate.net page. That's basically got, uh, what, what would you find on the researchgate again? Is that basically where your work is at? Yeah, so some of the um, papers, research gates, the network set up so you can, um, people that are members of the public can access um, research. So there should be some of my papers available on there, but um, I'd be happy to be contacted via Twitter as well and, and to share any of my work if anybody wants to get in touch. 
All right. And uh, Tervald Fenris Chain. Wow, that's a great name. Gives us $2 and says, love you. You're all awesome. Uh, thank you. And uh, thanks, guys, for joining us on the Fireside Chat. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. This was a great interview. And I hope that we see more of Dr. Liz Bates and uh, the work that she does. I want to thank you. Dr. Bates for coming on today, and I want to thank you guys for watching, and I want to thank Allison for popping in with a couple of her own questions. Uh, that's it for me, so we will see you guys on the next Fireside Chat.